morning to continue your walk through the book of Acts, and we come this morning to chapter 7. We take a look at the first eight verses. Now understand, this message really is one section, 1 through 53, but I decided to follow the format that Stephen lays out. So we'll be looking at the first eight verses. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Acts chapter 7. If you're using a pew Bible, you can find this on page 914. Now before we read God's word and hear it preached, let's go to our Lord and ask that he illumine our hearts and minds that we might rightfully receive that which he has for us. I ask you to please join me in prayer. Lord God, we do come before you this morning, thanking you and praising you, Lord, because you are so good to us, Lord. You have your covenantal plan that you implemented through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, you reveal this to us through the pages of Scripture. So Lord, help us to understand this promise of deliverance that you hold out before us. Help us, Lord, to truly see that which you have for us. Lord, clear from our hearts and our minds anything that would impede our ability to hear you properly. Lord, be with me, your servant. Help me, Lord, to truly speak your words, to properly handle this text, to rightly divide it, Lord, so that hearts are convicted and converted, so that your people are built up in holiness and comfort, and so that your name receives all the glory. We ask this in Jesus Christ, in your precious name. Amen. So Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Hear now God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. And a high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect that his offspring would be sojourners, and a land belonging to others who would, be, who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. A good trial attorney, preacher, storyteller, they all share a common trait, and that is that they can develop a narrative that resonates with their audience while concisely conveying the point that they're trying to get across. See, they have a structure to their message, their presentation, that draws all the here to the intended conclusion. And that's just what we see Stephen doing this morning in Acts 7, which is the longest sermon in Acts. It's 53 verses. But like I said, don't panic. We're not going to do all 53 verses, just eight. Because we're going to see here how Stephen, what he's doing is structuring his message through four redemptive points in history. And he's doing this to show that God's covenantal plan was never about the earthly Jerusalem temple, but it was always about how it was founded on God's one true temple, His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what we're going to do over the next four weeks is follow Stephen's structure. And it's going to be four segments. It's going to lead us to this one big point. He's going to have a little point in between them. We're going to follow the pattern that Stephen does. We're going to look at Abraham, Joseph, Moses, and then the early kingship that predates the temple. So this morning we begin where Stephen does, with Abraham and God's covenantal plan. I want you to follow along, because here's what you're going to see on the way to this morning's point. First, God calls you. Second, God's promise to you. Third, you'll be delivered. And fourth, God seals your deliverance. And this brings us to the point of the message 
which is the point of the text. Get this down. Let this resonate in your hearts. Take this away with you. God promises deliverance, so follow his plan. First, God calls you. Did you ever plan a trip and you go to great care to make sure it's planned out properly? You know, you look at maps, you plan out your route, you plug it into GPS, and you still find out you get lost because a road is closed or a tree's down. Maybe the map was out of date or your GPS, it just keeps sending you someplace like you can't go, like through a lake. See, what this shows you is, what you all know so well, is even man's most carefully crafted plans can sometimes leave you lost. But not so with God. And that's why you want to hear what Stephen's telling you this morning. That you need to focus not on yourself and your plan, but you need to follow God's plan. That means you need to know God's plan. You need to know what his covenantal plan is. And that's what, what Stephen's doing here, is focusing his defense, not on himself, but on God's covenantal plan. See, what he's doing is, Stephen has given you this overarching, redemptive history lesson. Understand this. This is his time to defend himself. These leaders want to know these charges have just been leveled by these false accusers, that he's trying to speak against Moses and God and trying to destroy the temple. Is this true? Did you really say this? Now's the time to defend yourself. Look at verse 1. And the high priest said, Are these things so? This is Stephen's opportunity to say, does he really speak against Moses, God, and the temple? Is he against the temple rituals? The question is his invitation to present his defense. And what does he do? He shows his wisdom by not focusing on himself, but again, turning his argument and position to God's covenantal plan, which begins well before the temple. It begins with God calling you through his call to Abraham. And I want you to see what Stephen does here. He shows great restraint and great respect by the way he starts his defense. Look what he says in verse 2. See, in this language you're about to hear, he's identifying himself with the tribunal. Those who are charging him, he's saying, hey guys, I'm one of you. Because he starts out in verse 2 by saying, brothers and fathers. You see that restraint, that respect he's showing? And then he says, hear me. Now this is key, because this is imperative language. What he's saying is, this is important. You need to listen to me. You need to hear what I'm about to tell you. See, he's on trial for his life. They want to know, you really stand against God, Moses, and the temple? And he says, listen to me. You need to hear what I'm about to say. And with all ears are on him, he doesn't do what you expect him to do. He doesn't do like a good defense attorney would do. He doesn't pull out tapes and transcripts to show, look, here's what he really said, and it doesn't match the accusations. He doesn't do that. And he doesn't call forward 100 character witnesses to say, look, I know Stephen. He's a good guy. You can believe him. You can trust him. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't focus on himself, but he turns to God and his covenantal plan. And he does this by starting out by saying, God is a glorious God who calls you into his presence, just as he called Abraham. Look how verse 2 ends. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Do you see the brilliance of Stephen's defense? You see what he just did? He's being charged with speaking against maligning God's name. They accused him of blaspheming God. And how does he start? By saying God is a glorious God. And not only that, he talks about God's call to Abraham, which does something else. It addresses this idea of the importance of the temple. Because he's showing that God existed well before the temple. See, think about what Stephen's on trial for. These Jewish leaders have heard testimony that he's speaking against the temple and all the temple regulations. They think that what Stephen's doing is going to cause a real problem because God can only be found in the temple. So if the temple's gone, then so is God. But as you know, that's just not the case at all. God is not confined to a temple because God is omnipresent. This means God is everywhere. So God can call you 
from wherever you're found. Just as God appeared to Abraham outside the temple and outside this very land that they're standing in now, so too he can do that today. See, you may find this hard to believe, but it's true. People don't have to come to church to find God. You know where they can find God? They can find him in the supermarket, at the bank, on every street corner. Because if you're there, then you can show them God. God can use you to call them, just as he called Abraham. Because what God wants is his people from every tongue, tribe, and nation who are currently outside the church being called into his presence. I mean, think about yourself. Isn't that where you were at? Weren't you outside the church, not even seeking God, when all of a sudden, bam, he showed up and called you to himself, united you to Jesus Christ, and the Spirit brought union? Well, guess what? If he can do that with you, he can do it with your loved one, with your family, with your friends. And understand something you see here with Abraham. Sometimes, when he calls you, it means calling you not just to himself, but away from everything else. That means... Those things that you hold most dear, those things you love most, your family, your friends, your hobbies, God may be calling you away from all those things as he calls you to himself. Because that's what he did with Abraham. Look at verse 3. Look how he goes on to say it here. Stephen says, God said to Abraham, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land I will show you. See, right here you see how God's call to you is not just a call to him, but a call away from other things. And often the things that often hold your greatest love and attention. You realize some people, I'm sure nobody here, but some people actually love their family, their jobs, their hobbies, their leisure more than they love God. But you know what? God doesn't want to compete for your attention and your devotion and your love. He wants all of you. He calls you to himself by calling you away from all these things. Because true faith is seen when you're willing to leave everything behind. Think about it. That's what he did with Abraham. How does he see Abraham's faith? Because he calls Abraham away from his land, his home, and his family. To follow him to a land that he yet to see. So the question is this. Are you willing to be called to where God calls you if it means leaving all that you truly love and hold so dear back in the past? Are you willing to do that? If God is calling you, and that means leaving your mother or your son, your job or your neighbor, are you willing to go where God is called? What if he's calling you to an unnamed land, to an uncertainty. Are you still willing to go? You should be, because understand when God calls you, he calls you with a promise, which brings us to our second point, God's promise to you. I'm sure you're all familiar with that idea. I'm sure you've done it yourself. You want somebody to go someplace with you or come to some event, so what do you do? You make them promises. You say it's going to be so good. You're going to have so much fun. You're going to make so many new friends there. Or the best, they're going to have such good, delicious food there. You don't want to miss it. You won't be sorry you came. We understand the value and the power of a promise. And you know what? God's promise to you comes in the same way. Because God calls you to himself with a promise. But I want you to understand something. No promise on earth can compare to the promise that God makes to you. The promise that he calls you with. See, because God's promise is a covenantal promise that's part of his covenantal plan. And that promise to you comes in the context of him fulfilling his covenantal plan. So he may call you as he did Abraham, call you to leave land, home, and family and follow him. But you can do so. Because it comes with his promise. Look at verse 4. Look what he says. Then he, that is Abraham, went out from the land of the Chaldeans. That is his hometown and lived in Haran. I want you to understand your geography. Understand this ancient map. Let's put it into modern terms. Haran 
is modern day Turkey, which is north of Kosadan, Chaldea, which is basically Syria and Iraq. So you have Iraq down here, Syria, and Turkey's way up here. Abraham's living down here, and God calls him way up north. And he does it because he says, I'm going to give you a land that I've yet to show you, a better land. And you see through that promise that it's never really about land. Maybe you're saying some wind, and you just said God promised to give him a better land. So how's it not about land? Well, you come to understand this and see this when you understand what our text shows. That Abraham never receives any actual physical land. I'm talking not one piece, not one lot, not even a shovel of dirt, not even enough square footage to put one foot on. Look at verse 5. It says, Yet he, God, gave him, Abraham, no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length. The fact that Abraham never received any actual physical land, that keys you into a key thing going on here. That what God promises to you, what he promises to Abraham, is so much better and so much more than just physical land or material wealth. See, God's promise is better than that. It's better than just a life filled with perfect health and a multitude of wealth. Think of it this way. Imagine you can have this, 70 or 80 years, illness-free, never a cold, never a sneeze, perfect health, and on top of that, all the wealth of the world, never being denied anything you want, but you spend eternity in hell. That's one option. Or you can have a life that's got ups and downs, colds and flus, losses and blessings, but an eternity in the presence of your Lord and Savior. Which would you prefer? If you're sitting here saying, I think the second sounds better, I want that eternity thing, well, guess what? I got great news for you. Because that's what God promises you, to bring you into his presence for all eternity. That's what he's promising to do, to call you to himself, because his promise is grounded in his call to you calling you away from all that would hinder or interfere with your complete devotion to Him so you can live forever in His presence. See, God's covenantal plan has always been about calling His covenantal people into His presence. And guess what? That's what He promised to Abraham, and that's what He promises to each and every one of you. Isn't that good to hear? That's where you're headed. That's where God's calling you to. Not just to a big party with all the food you like, but to an eternity in the presence of your Lord and Savior. Think of it this way. It's a covenantal community promise for Christ's church that begins with Abraham and extends to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and lands with you. Because God is calling you. If you're here this morning as one who has not professed faith in Jesus Christ, then hear him calling you now, calling you into his presence. See, this is what Stephen's getting at with this tribunal. It's what he's laying out. And you see this when he ends verse 5 this way. He says, but promise to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. See, that language confirms for you that the promise to Abraham was not about an earthly land or an earthly temple. It wasn't about having a biological family. It was about something so much more. And you know this because God makes this promise to Abraham when? When he's aimlessly wandering around, far from home and family, and with no child to call his own. That's when the promise comes to him. This shows you that the promise is not about the here and now, but it's about tomorrow. It's about the future. It's about the everlasting eternity. That's the promise to Abraham, and it's a promise to you, and that should encourage you and excite you, because it says that God's promise is so much bigger and extends beyond Jerusalem, beyond the walls of the temple, and beyond all that you know here. It's something that God's yet to show you. Something to where he's calling you. And this is why Abraham continued to walk steadfastly after his God who called him away from home, family, and land. Because he understood that what God promised 
is so much better than anything this earth has to offer you. And brothers and sisters, that's the same promise that God makes to you. And his promise is that he will fulfill his covenantal plan. And that's why his promise is so much better than perfect health, all the wealth, or some castle on the beach. Because what he promises you, which brings us to our third point. His promise is, you'll be delivered. You hear that? You'll be delivered. Stephen showing this Jewish tribunal how God promised Abraham land and descendants, not as a means of showing them what all we can have on this earth, but as a means of pointing them to where they find their deliverance, through Abraham's seed. And who is Abraham's seed is envisioned here? None other than your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is made clear in Galatians 3.16. Here's what Paul says. Here's what he writes there. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Listen to this language. It doesn't say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring. And here's a cross. Who is Christ? See, that was the promise to Abraham, and that's the promise to you, that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's covenantal plans. His promise to Abraham is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. He's the true temple that God brings all who he calls. Jesus Christ was sent from his throne in heaven to save you from your sin as part of God's fulfilling his covenantal plan and promises. And this shows you how much God loves you. Because think about what that means. Think about the cost. I mean, Abraham, he had to leave land, family, and home to follow God. But you know what it cost God? It cost him the life of his only begotten son whom he loved. It cost Jesus Christ his very life. That's how much your Lord and your God loves you. He was willing to lay down his life so you might live. So knowing that, why would you want to stay back here with all that's in the past when you can move forward toward God's intended goal, the fulfillment of his covenantal plan, your union with Jesus Christ, and eternity in his presence? Stephen is speaking about the temple here. But not the earthly temple that his tribunal is thinking about, but the true temple, Jesus Christ. And he shows this, makes this clear by how he carries forward with his argument. Because he speaks about how our fathers, notice again that language, our fathers, again identifying with them, were doing what? They were basically oppressed and enslaved for 400 years. Verse 6, look what it says. Look at verse 6. And God spoke to this effect, that Abraham's offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. See, this makes clear, not just that Abraham's descendants would be oppressed and enslaved, but they also would be delivered. And you're ready for the really good news? Are you sitting down for this? You are Abraham's descendants. You're the ones who have been enslaved and oppressed by sin and the law, and you need to be delivered. And guess what? God has delivered you. He promises he'll deliver you, and he's done so through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what he's getting at here. That's what Stephen's getting at by tying in the descendants' captivity in Egypt as part of God's covenantal plan unfolding throughout history to show that God's covenantal plan was never simply about this land, this earth, or this temple. But it was always about God delivering his people, your fathers, your descendants, and all of you from sin's snare and death's destruction by bringing you into your eternal home where you live forever in God's presence, where you get called in to the true temple so you can truly worship your God. Look at the language he uses. Look what he says in verse 7. But I will judge the nation that they serve, says God. And after that, they'll come out and worship me. Look how it ends. In this place. 
See, this is why God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, to walk on this earth in perfect obedience and die as the perfect atoning sacrifice for your sins. He did this so that you might be delivered. Through Christ's death on the cross and His resurrection from the dead, you've been delivered from sin and death. Just as God promised. He promises you, you'll be delivered. And He delivers on that. And your deliverance is so much better than just escaping your Egyptian captors. Just getting away from the things that ensnare you. Because your deliverance means never suffering again. If the idea of a truly health-free existence really excites you, then you know what the answer is? It's Jesus Christ. Because in eternity, there will be no colds, no sneezes, not a shed tear, no hurts, no heartaches, no pain. Just an eternity lived in the presence of your Lord and Savior who shares all he has with you. And you see this so clearly. You see so clearly it's not about the temple, but about Jesus Christ and the true temple with that language in this place. See, Stephen's using this language to emphasize that the Jewish temple's not what's in view in God's covenantal plan, but rather it's being in God's eternal presence, which comes through His Son, Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Being set free, not just from your Egyptian captors, but being set free from the sin that ensnares you, from the debt that holds you. No longer being a bondage under the wall, being released from that. Because what is Stephen talking about here? He's not talking about destroying Moses or God's plan for the temple, but he's talking about the fulfillment of it. God's covenantal plan, fulfilling his promises. And God promises you what he promised Abraham, that you'll be delivered. That language shows that after 400 years, you'll be set free. <coughs> and I want to tell you something. This is what awaits you after your death. But you don't have to wait till you die to be in the presence of your Lord and God. You know what you can do? You can bow your knee, humble your heart, confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and guess what will happen? You'll be delivered, just as God promises. So why not turn to Christ, trust in Him to deliver you from your sin debt. Do this, knowing that God promises you'll be delivered. And as you think about this promise, and you're excited about that, guess what? It gets better yet. Because God doesn't just promise to you, but he seals his promise. Which brings us to our final point. God seals your deliverance. When you get married, there's this exchange of vows that's followed by an exchange of rings. Do you ever think why that is? Well, here's why it is. Because the ring confirms that promises have just been made. It says, I now belong to another. It kind of seals the deal, as it were. Well, guess what? That idea of covenantal vows and promises being sealed flows from God's covenantal plan. Because what he does is he promises to deliver you, and he seals the deal with his covenantal promise, his son. Like the marriage ceremony, the ring that represents the promises that were made, so too God gives you a sign that signifies promises have been made. And you know what God's covenantal sign of your deliverance is? It's a sign you see in our text. The sign of circumcision. Look at verse 8. Look what it says. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. Now I want you to think about that and see what's so crucial to understand here. This covenantal sign is given after the promise has been made, but before the fulfillment has come about. Do you know why that's important? Because that ties in to the new covenantal sign of baptism, which is why we baptize our babies. Because what are we doing? We're taking hold of God's covenantal promise to us and expecting the fulfillment that's yet to come. And that's seen through the sign that God gives, that covenantal sign of the new covenant of baptism. And think about how circumcision was limited to Jewish boys, but the new covenant, which is a better covenant, is no longer limited. 
It's applied to boys and girls alike, to Jew and Greek alike, to everyone who God calls to himself. When you apply that covenantal sign, that seal, that baptism, you know what you're saying? You're saying, God has called me to himself, God has delivered me and my children, and I expect to see him fulfill his promises, because God fulfills his covenantal plan. Amen. Colossians 2, 11 and 12 makes this so clear. Because Paul's speaking about your union with Christ. And here's what he says. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made, listen to this language, a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism. Baptism is a new covenant sign that replaces the old covenant sign of circumcision. And like circumcision, it's showing how you've been cut off, no longer belong to the world, but belong to God's covenantal community. Our children are members of the church. They're what we call non-communicant members, but they're members nonetheless. You know why? Because they're under God's covenant. They're part of his covenantal plan. And we expect to see our covenantal children one day stand and profess faith. Because we understand that the resting of the faith depends not on us, but on God who gave the Son. See, that's why it's so good. That's why it's so beneficial. And that's why it's so much better than the old covenant sign. Think about it this way. God who calls you to himself is the same God who gives you the sign of the covenant. See, your salvation is a monergistic work of God, and in the same way, your baptism is a work of God. It's a covenant sign that God institutes. This is why we don't adhere to believer's baptism. Believer's baptism says, I did it. I chose Christ, and now I want to claim the promises for myself. No! It doesn't come after the promise and after the fulfillment. It comes after the promise, but before the fulfillment. So the promise is that you belong to God as do your covenantal children. You see this in 1 Corinthians 7 as well. If one parent is a believer, then guess what? Their children are baptized because they're under the covenant just as well. And that's what makes it so wonderful. Because again, it says it rests with God, not with you. Don't you want your salvation being held in God's hands and not your own? I mean, how fickle are we? How quickly do we love somebody one day and hate them the next? I mean, don't you at your wedding say to your wife, I will love you forever. And what happens the first time she annoys you? Do you still love her? No. But God's love is forever. It's eternal. It never ends. It's unconditional. And that's why he gives you this seal, to make it a guarantee to you. He seals your deliverance with his covenantal seal, that covenant of baptism, that covenantal promise. See, people, they get married, they make vows, they get mad, and they get divorced. But there's no divorce in God, because he's in charge of it all. You may say, I want to leave, but God says, you ain't going nowhere. You belong to me, and I'm holding you. You're mine. That makes your deliverance a guarantee. That should put a smile on your face and get you excited. That even if you want to leave, God says you can't. Because you belong to him, he claimed you. And he puts his seal and mark upon you. Let that thought bring a smile to your face. Let that thought remind you that God seals your deliverance. Amen. In this life, we love to make plans. We make plans all the time. I mean, little girls right now, they're already planning their weddings. People are in middle school, they're planning where they're going to college. People are in high school, planning their careers. We even start planning our retirement as soon as we get employed, and we don't know if we're going to live that long. There's no guarantees in life, are there? There's no guarantee with man's plans. The most well-crafted plan of man can still leave you lost, but not so with God. That's why you need to understand God's covenantal plan. And understand this. Man makes you promises, and he knows that they're not really guaranteed. So what does he do? He says there's a money-back guarantee. Like, that'll get you to pie, right? Oh, I'll waste three years of my life, but maybe I'll get my money back. That'll make all the difference. But God doesn't do that. His promise comes with his own guarantee, his own assurance, because he gives you his promise of deliverance, and he seals it with his sign. And that's so much better. 
than just getting your money back after things fail. See, God's covenantal plan has always been about Him calling you home into His presence, delivering you from sin and death so you can forever be in His presence under His covenantal care. So what this means is, as you go through this earth, go through your life, making your wedding plans, choosing your colleges, thinking about your work, don't just look at the temporal, the here and now, but always ask this question, how do my plans fit in with God's covenantal plan to deliver me? Is this going to enhance my eternal existence or just be better for the here and now? See, because it's never about the dress you choose, the job or the school you choose. But it's always about which choice keeps you following God's covenantal plan. So here's what I want you to do. Because I know in this week, this month, this year, you're all going to face choices. Because we face them in life all the time. Think of every choice as a crossroads where you can go one of two ways. Either closer towards God in accordance with his plan or further away in accordance with your own temporal plan. And understand, man's plans come with no guarantee, but God's plan has the assurance of your deliverance. So choose God's plan every time. Do this because God promises deliverance. So follow his plan. Let's pray. Lord God, we do come before you. We thank you and praise you, Lord, that you care for us. And Lord, you show this care for us by the way from eternity past you entered into a covenant plan with us, Lord. You took the initiative to call us to yourself, just like you came to Abraham when he was in a distant land, calling him to yourself, Lord. So too you did so with us. When we were outside the church walls, outside running from you, you called us to yourself. So Lord, help us to remember this. As we stand at crossroads in life, help us to always be asking, how would this fit with God's covenantal plan? Lord, help us all to see that you promised deliverance, so we need to follow your plan. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen.